I'm going to read the first three verses of John 14, and then we'll pray together. This is the perfect Word of God. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Let's pray together. Father, here, here we are, some of us having traveled a long distance to be amongst your people, to sit under the preached word. And yet, Lord, every one of us, if we have any sense of our need, we know that you must feed us, that you must nurture the word of God as it is proclaimed, that you must penetrate our hearts that are often hardened and distracted and divided, Lord, we're, we're seeing that, that you must work. And that is my prayer this morning, that you would work in me as I preach and that you would work in these as they hear. We need a sovereign and supernatural intervention by the Most High this morning. Come and dwell among us. Be exalted in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. It was uh, several years ago we had a, a man that was essentially passing through that, that just enjoyed a, a period of months where he was in the church here in Denton. And he ended up moving to the southern part of Texas. But for the time that we had him, I was able to enjoy a couple of meals with him. One day we were at Dickie's Barbecue here in Denton, enjoying a meal. And after the meal, the conversation turned to the theme of the reality that the Bible teaches us that Christians immediately upon death are in the presence of Christ. And we were just back and forth sharing. I had brought up a couple of passages where this is stated in Scripture, namely Philippians 1 and 2 Corinthians 5. A few minutes into the conversation, as we're sitting there at the table, a, another gentleman walks over to the table and greets us. And, and with a warm smile and a handshake, he, he introduces himself as a fellow gospel minister in Denton who now works full-time for a funeral home. And he said he had overheard our discussion and that if we'd allow him, he, he had something he wanted to share. Well, his countenance was bright, seemed like this could be a real brother. We said, share. And what he had to say that, that afternoon was both biblical and encouraging. He, he pointed first to the thief on the cross. And you remember as well as I do what Jesus said to the thief on the cross today, you will be with me in paradise. And then he pointed to this text right here before us, John 14, verses 1 through 3. One of the things that I remember that he mentioned that afternoon was the fact that in his ministry, in and through the funeral home, he had heard this text preached literally thousands of times. Why? Because these verses are full of comfort, that's why. And yet, my brothers and sisters, yet, I don't believe these verses were primarily intended to be preached and applied in the setting of a funeral. The situation before us in the text, as we will shortly see, is one of troubled souls. But these disciples aren't troubled over a death that has taken place. They are troubled over a separation that is to come. Thus, I think all of us 
by God's grace, need to hear this text in a fresh way and apply it in a fresh way this morning. We need to hear today Jesus Christ addressing and comforting his disciples both then and now. Because what Jesus does in this text, the way that he communicates to his men is so tender, so loving to these heavy and troubled hearts. Specifically, hearts that were troubled based on things Jesus had just spoken. So for the sake of context, let's take note of the events leading up to the text that I read this morning. Thus, we're going to have to step back into the 13th chapter of John. Uh, This is, brethren, one of those instances where the chapter division from John 13 to 14 isn't all that helpful. Now, I am grateful for the medieval contribution of chapter divisions. I think you probably are too. But the chapter divisions are not inspired. What Jesus speaks in John 14, 1 is directly connected to the things that he had just spoken to his disciples moments before. And for starters, we need to see that John 14, 1 is not the first time we see the word troubled. In chapter 13, we see that Jesus was actually the first one troubled. His troubled heart precedes the troubled heart of his disciples in John 14. Look with me at John 13, 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. It is as though we have this brief scene here, an intimate moment of Jesus speaking to his most intimate followers. It is a scene that is essentially bookended by the word troubled. And between those two bookends sits a whole bunch of bad news. There are three things that Jesus communicates in the latter part of chapter 13 to his disciples in that extended moment that that would not only have been unsettling, they, they would have just been outright shocking to hear. And the first we already saw in verse 21, Jesus says, being troubled in his own spirit, he says to these men, one of you will betray me. Now, we know that the betrayer is Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. But here in this room, in this moment, Judas is publicly identified as a betrayer. And then you remember he leaves the place where they were all congregated. Well, that's, that's some heavy, hard-hitting news. But that's just the first piece. Second, in verse 33... Jesus looks the remaining 11 in the face and he says, yet a little while I am with you. Yet a little while I am with you easily, easily. This is the most shocking news of all. Jesus looks these men in the face and he tells them he is soon to depart from them. Talk about heavy news but he's not done. Third, to Peter, in verse 38, to Peter, he says, you will deny me three times. You will deny me three times. A a betrayal, a departure, a denier. As I said, the whole scene is entirely unsettling. This is a lot of heavy news in a really short period of time. And what could be more heavy than the Lord Jesus Christ soon to depart? He has been their life and devotion for the past few years. And suddenly he's departing. Now here's what you've got to see this morning. And this is huge. Jesus is troubled. 
That's what the text tells us. That's the insight, the inspired scriptures give to us. He is troubled. I mean, he's, he's big time troubled. Why? Because the hour of the power of darkness is upon him. Because the grappling in Gethsemane is just around the corner. Because the agony of the cross is before him. He sees it coming. And more than that, he feels it coming. And yet... Yet, in the midst of his troubled heart, he wholly gives himself to comforting the troubled heart of his disciples. Can you even believe that? This is tenderness like we just don't know. This is, this is care that is amazing out of this world. This is the amazing love that we sang about this morning. I don't think we've thought enough about this, dear ones. Oftentimes, when our hearts are troubled, we've got nothing to give anyone else. We're, we're trying to manage our own anxiety and pain and dread and hurt, but not our big-hearted Christ. Do you see this? In this difficult moment, big-hearted Jesus speaks words of consolation to these men that he deeply loved. These are the circumstances which bring us to the text this morning in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. What follows in John 14 is a series of deep encouragements that are as much for us as they were for those men in Jesus' day. And yet our focus, for the sake of time, will be on verse 3 this morning. I have broken the message up into three parts. I have prayed and continue to pray that it will be food for your soul. Because, brothers and sisters, we are in desperate need of the wonderful, merciful Savior we see in this text. We are in desperate need. Look with me at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Here are the three parts. One, Christ's coming. Two, Christ's commitment and three, Christ's closeness. His coming, his commitment, his closeness. And my aim is to simply walk through the text, maybe to help you to see it in a new way, maybe to bring us to, to what I feel is, is, is the deeper part of what Christ is communicating in this moment, just to attempt to open up some part of its meaning to you. Because let me tell you, these inspired words from the lips of our dear Redeemer, are so worth considering. This morning, I am praying that we all would be like those described in Luke's gospel who hung on every word that proceeded out of Jesus' mouth. Hear him with fresh ears this morning, saints. Let's begin where the text begins, with Christ's coming. And if I go... And prepare a place for you. I will come again. The, the word if, for starters, it isn't a traditional conditional if, as, as though he may or may not be going. It, it could read, maybe should read, uh, once or after, and, and after I go, and once I go. Christ has just informed his disciples that he is going away. He, he has told them they cannot follow him now. Not yet. But it's as though he says, don't worry, dear ones. I will return. I will come again. I will not leave you as orphans. And in addition to that, if we know the remainder of John 14, I will send my Holy Spirit to be with you and in you. Now, I want to take a moment to identify what I see as an imbalance amongst many modern Christians. 
Uh, I, I am totally sold out to what J.C. Ryle described as biblical proportionality, that, that with the proportion Scripture dedicates to a certain theme, we as Christians need to dedicate ourselves in like manner to those themes. Thus, there are some things that we should be talking a whole lot about. And there are some things that aren't as important that won't be as often spoken of. And I see a bit of an imbalance here amongst modern Christians. So much attention of the church of the 21st century is given to the first advent. I mean, it is directly tied, after all, to the overtly materialistic Christmas holiday. The birth of Christ. Sadly, much less attention is given to the Advent yet to come. The second Advent. You know, in the first Advent, Christ, the Messiah, comes to be slain as a lamb. In the second Advent, Christ comes as a lion to rescue and conquer. Reminds me of Hebrews 9.28, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting Him. So it seems with some of us, there is an imbalance of interest when it comes to the first and second advent of our Lord. My, my suspicion is that we are far too earthly-minded and rather happy with our comfortable existence as the church in the West. We, we aren't often pressed and oppressed. We, we aren't often afflicted and conflicted. We have been to some degree bedazzled by the trinkets of today, so much so that we don't achingly long for the unfading beauties of tomorrow, that eternal day. Sleepy Christians feel far too many church pews today. So we need the wake-up call of this doctrine, Christ's second coming, to shock and to startle us to life, to urgency, to working while it is still day. While these dear disciples in our text absolutely needed the promise and assurance of Jesus' return to comfort and ease their heart trouble. Let me ask you, do you even want Christ to come back? Don't be so quick to utter yes and amen. But let this be a call to do fresh inventory, fresh heart work. Because over the years of ministry, I have heard the sentiment from more than one professing Christian that if Christ came tomorrow, that would kind of throw a kink in some of my plans. I mean, I love my wife. And if Christ comes back, no marriage in heaven. I love my kids. Maybe you've heard such things too. Maybe you've even thought and felt these things yourself. Just be sure, very sure, that you aren't letting idols get in the way of the pure joy and comfort and hopeful expectation we should have as God's people that Jesus is coming again. It reminds me of a straightforward admonition from John Calvin, and he was full of those, which is still so applicable in our own day. Quote, Our folly comes from the fact that our mind is more or less dazzled by the false glitter of wealth, distinctions, and power, which are superficially attractive and which stop us from looking further ahead. By the same token, our heart, which is full of greed, ambition, and other evil desires, is held so fast by them that it cannot look heavenwards. There is no middle way, he says. Either we hold the world in contempt, or else it will hold us fast in its fierce embrace. 
It is sad, always sad, when our earthly, inordinate loves block us from knowing more of the love of Christ. And brethren, that's what I want you to see in the text this morning. That's what you should see in the statement, I will come again. You see, we, we think of the second coming as a chapter in the systematic theology, as an eschatological event, and it is. But it is more than that. It is the loving heart of Christ who will return for his bride. He tells his disciples he's going away. The disciples' hearts sink into their pinky toes. Gloom and dread and darkness instantly surround them in that moment. And Judas is a betrayer and Peter is a triple denier. And there they stand. Has all of this been for nothing? Is it all going by the wayside? Did I just give the last two or three years of my life for nothing? Put yourself in their shoes, dear ones. Don't think you would have responded any differently or with a higher degree of maturity. These men are struck down and deflated men when they hear this news. But there stands my Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe God. Believe me, I will come again. What prompts this kind of consolation? How is it even possible for the man of sorrows in this moment with a troubled heart himself to say such things? It's his love. He, he can't not speak comfort he can't be silent in a moment like this. Don't you get it, brethren? Jesus' heart was overwhelmed with trouble, but there was something like a wave that rose up within his overwhelmed heart, and he must comfort his men. Jesus speaking comfort in that moment was 100% motivated by love for them. Do you see his giant heart here. I want you to gaze upon this loving one this morning. The sweet assurances of his return should stir up deep joy and hope and peace within us as it did those men in that hour. When the world is falling to pieces, when the onslaught of evil increasingly mounts up around us, when wicked men like serpents surround us and hiss at us, when our own sin discourages and disheartens us, having contempt for this present evil age, we should have a fixed and joy-filled expectation in Christ's promised return. He said, I will come again. And so we should be those longing with the Apostle John in Revelation 22.20 where we have read likely dozens of times, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And brother and sister, we want to be right there with the Apostle who says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Not many weeks ago, Amber, my dear bride, and a dear friend of hers, a sister in the church, enjoyed a, a weekend away together. Now, I'm holding down the fort. I, I knew approximately when, when my bride would be returning home. I knew it'd be sometime in the afternoon, maybe two, three o'clock. But I hadn't seen my wife in approximately 51 hours and 37 minutes. <laughs> I, I, was, I was eager for her return. That, that's just my weakness. I recall doing what we can do with technology today and checking find my iPhone a couple of times just to monitor her progress. I'm not a stalker, I'm her husband. Uh, I was just ready to see her. I was ready to see her. How much more so should you and I 
be longing for the return of our tender-hearted Redeemer? Do you long for Jesus to come again? Do you long for that? There's another illustration that I think will shine a light even more significant. Uh, my last trip to the country of Jordan with my dear brother Michael Durham was the fall of 2019. It was a special trip. We were there with uh, dear brother Rami. Ministry seemed profitable. The conference was a seeming success. Uh, the conversations were good. The brethren were encouraged. It was quite a trip. And then we come to the last night. We're dropped off in Amman, Jordan. We say goodbye to the dear saints there, hugs. We check into the hotel for a single night before we're waking up early the next morning to be carted off to the airport. And dear ones, I cannot begin to describe the eagerness that I felt, physically felt in my chest that night to get back home to Amber and my family. As I lay in bed that night, I'd watch the clock and hour after hour would pass and I, I was just so ready to be home, I couldn't fall asleep. I'm not sure I've ever been that eager to come home. In the end, maybe I got an hour and a half, two and a half hours of sleep. What's the point? The point is this. If my imperfect love for my wife and family led me to feel like that. To the point that I couldn't hardly sleep due to the excitement and expectation of my return. How much more does Christ feel that toward you and me? Have you considered that before? I think part of our problem is that we're more prone to think of Jesus as a helpful advocate in heaven rather than the fierce lover of his bride. We, we default to the proper theological classifications of our Savior and forget the relational ramifications of his love for us. Thank you, Brother Jesse, for last night. Can you picture Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father sitting there just itching to return and take us home? You should be able to based on a text like this or based on a text like John 17 verse 24. Father, Jesus says, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me. You see, saints, this is a foundational part of the heart of Christ. He longs to be with his people. This transitions us right into the second part of the verse. From Christ's coming to Christ's commitment. Look with me at the text. Jesus has promised not only to return but something more than that as well. I will come again and will take you to myself. As I have thought on that single phrase, I will take you to myself, I sometimes begin to weep. I, I know the King James Bible here says, receive you unto myself, but... I think the ESV and ASB and IV read better here. I will take you to myself. The word take gives the sense of both coming alongside us and, and then aggressively taking us to be with himself. It is Jesus Christ rescuing his bride. It, it is so beautiful a phrase. I feel like we could milk comfort from it for a dozen lifetimes. When reading these familiar words, and I trust these words are familiar to you, do you stop here and meditate? He, he, he just said, I'm going to come again, and I'm going I'm to take you to myself. Sadly, I have read right past these words over the years far too many times. But with these words, I see Jesus Christ Looking each of us in the eyes, beloved. 
with longings in his heart to be with you, he says, I will come. I will take you to myself. I can't not have you with me. This is one of those I will texts, isn't it? I will come again. I will take you to myself. And when Jesus says, I will do it, we can take it to the bank, dear Christian. He's going to do it. He can't fail to do it. He is always true to his word. But I want you to see in this a deeper reality. This is Christ's commitment to us. Yes, absolutely, he's promised to take us to himself. But look deeper still. What lays at the foundation of this commitment? This commitment is built on undying love for his people. This isn't something practical. This isn't the necessary outcome of logic or the proper solution to a mathematical equation. This right here is the language of love. Yes, he's going to return and he's going to judge the wicked. Yes, he's going to make crooked things straight and right every wrong. But what is the core motivation of his second coming? He tells us, I will come again. And I will take you to myself. I am coming for you, beloved bride. I've prepared a home. I've been waiting for this day to arrive. It is time I'm coming to get you. This is why Thomas Brooks, the English Puritan, could say that the believer's last day is his best day. He's underscoring this reality right here. Whether your last day takes place on a deathbed, in relative comfort, or in a car accident, or at the second coming of Christ, it will be your best day. And it'll be your best day because the Lord Jesus Christ will take you to himself. There's another noteworthy thing to point out. Isn't it significant that Jesus says, I will take you to myself? Jesse pointed this out from Ephesians 3 as well. It's as though the language here really prompts for a locale, a place. I will take you to Dickie's Barbecue. But it doesn't give us that here. He doesn't say, I will take you to heaven. Nope. Why is that? He, he has talked about a place that he has prepared, but why is the place not the pinnacle of the promise? It is simply because Jesus is the heaven of heaven. Our husband is the heart, the climax, the most precious part of heaven. And he says to us in this text, I will take you to myself. This leads us right into the final part of the verse. Christ's closeness. I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. If that isn't the language of love, I don't know what is. The emphasis of these words here on the heels of Christ coming and taking us to himself only seems to further press home the reality of the intimacy of our union with Christ. He is coming again. He is taking us to himself. And this is no utilitarian deed. It isn't born out of duty as though Christ says, I have commitments to keep. No, this is born out of delight. Remember, I propose, do you see the second coming as an eschatological event or the burning heart of your Savior to come and take you to himself? This is overwhelming, heart-melting, intoxicating love and delight in Christ for his bride. If you've got a problem with the word intoxicating, read Proverbs 5. The husband, the great one, the one and only as we sang, he will have his bride to be with him forever. 
There is no one, there is nothing that can prevent his coming or the rescue of his bride. There's nothing on earth or in heaven or under the earth, nothing visible or invisible that will keep him from forever enjoying her. And the crazy thing here, dear ones, is that the her, that's you and me. If we're in Christ, all those united to Jesus Christ by grace through faith, can you believe it? Do you believe it? Jonathan Edwards, toward the end of his life and ministry, wrote this. Quote, the creation of the world seems to have been especially for this purpose. That the eternal Son of God might obtain a bride toward whom He might fully exercise the infinite love of His nature. And that in this way, God would be glorified. This is America's greatest theologian, likely summarizing the whole history of redemption in the language of husband loves bride. In this way, God has deemed to be glorified. Do you see what he saw? Do do you read your Bible like a textbook or do you read it like a love letter? Do you grasp even a tenth part of the depth of Christ's love for you? Do you default to Christ as king of your heart, to the imbalanced neglect, uh, Jesus lover of your soul? Listen to what he says. I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The language of love, the the language of intimacy, of face-to-face fellowship, the, the language of knowing Christ as He is to be known. You see, what a verse like this does, it pulls back the veil and lets us see into the deep recesses of the heart of our Savior. And you need to know this morning that the cure for any troubled heart is to peer into the tender, loving heart of Jesus Christ. Dear Christian, long for Christ's coming, especially since the sweetness of His love comes with it. Be ready, dear Christian, to welcome death when it confronts you, when Christ's loving embrace comes with it. Is this your mindset? Is this the way we're thinking? What we see in the text is Christ, who is clearly captivated by his bride. Are you, bride, clearly captivated by him, by his love for you? Do we say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.23, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. Is that what we're saying this morning? Is your cry in harmony with that of Solomon's song? You are altogether lovely. Do we stand with Mr. Stand Fast in Pilgrim's Progress, the second part, who just before he dies rejoices that I am going now to see that head that was crowned with thorns and that face that was spat upon for me. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight and shall be with him in whose company I delight. Are you imitating Samuel Rutherford's heart when he wrote, and he often wrote this way, didn't he? Quote, the bride takes not by a thousand degrees so much delight in her wedding garment as she does in her bridegroom, 
So we, in the life to come, shall not be so much affected with the glory that goes about us as with the bridegroom's joyful face and presence. Is this your heart? My brother, my sister, we cannot be those that settle for doctrinal purity alone. Be a lover of Christ. That, that is the greatest commandment after all, isn't it? To love Him with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. I, I sense that the need of the hour in the church today is to have her pews packed with beating heart Christians, love or die Christians. You can't keep me from my Savior Christians. As much as we love justification by faith and the doctrines of the Reformation, we need to fall in love with the justifier once more. Return to your first love, saints. Because He is coming again. He hasn't commissioned an angel to come in His place. He is coming again. He himself, for his bride, he won't share her with another. He grants to no other that great privilege. He is coming again. Are you ready for his return? Is your heart in order? Are you longing for his embrace? I'll close with a quote from a Puritan you've maybe never heard of by the name of James Birdwood. He says, It is as though Jesus is saying to us today, I will take you to myself, into the nearest union and communion with myself. And therefore, do not be unwilling to part with your dear relations do not be afraid to be separated from your bodies, your old friends. For when these earthly tabernacles are dissolved, immediately I will receive you to myself, which is best of all. You shall then enjoy the fruits of all my sufferings, death, resurrection, ascension, and intercession, as well as the fruits of all your labors, prayers, tears, and suffering, and shall find that I am faithful in making good all my promises, and that your labor was not in vain in the Lord. Then shall there be no longer any distance between you and me forever. Comfort yourselves and comfort one another with these words, he writes, closing with believe this and let not your heart be troubled. Let's pray. Big hearted Jesus. Oh, that, that we would see today and each day henceforth more of your tender, loving heart toward us. And not, not only what you've done, what you're doing, but simply your disposition of love toward your people, your bride. Open our eyes to these things. Give us eyes to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.